So does purpose matter inside this startup world? Does purpose matter? Or is it around a billion-dollar valuation? I love having conversations with people that I've never talked to before because there's not any preemptive stuff or probing for questions and say, hey, I have this list of things that we already talked about that we're going to ask. And because every time I read a new book or talk to other entrepreneurs, CEOs, people that have been in startup worlds, um, I learn something every time. Love it. And so selfishly, this podcast, even though I want to help other people, because if there would have been people out here helping me what, 13, 14 years ago before I started my entrepreneur endeavor, it would have helped a lot more. Absolutely. So um, you have all sorts of things I could get kicked off here. Oh, you gosh. have all my, so, so, here's, so, so here's what I'm going to do. I try not to give this like, let's talk for 10 minutes about who she is. But there are some things that you have done that make you a relevant voice in the startup space, yeah. in the space of being an entrepreneur. And so even though I'm not an award person, Like in 2018, Cincinnati Business Courier, so we're here in Cincinnati, um, you were a 40 under 40. Yep. And that is significant because it can be indicative of a few different things. What you've already accomplished and something new you're doing, but you're on, um, you're in the sights of people who know what's happening business-wise in Cincinnati. So can you explain to us that process of 2018 the four, the forty under forty, because that's a thing that I think people that aren't there, that they kind of dream of, and they're like, "Man, if I could get there." So, can you speak to the significance of it for you? Was it significant? Wasn't it? Did you feel good about it? How did it help your career? All yeah. those things. So, forty yeah. under forty. Forty under forty was really interesting. So, I thought what was probably funnier about the whole situation is the prior year in twenty seventeen. Um, I had been recognized for award of top 10 women who mean business in Cincinnati, which was a um, an honor where the business courier itself had looked for the top leader leadership in women in the region. And we're really, um, you know, trying to award uh, women with this recognition. And at that time, I believe I was the second class that had went through it. So there was only 10 other women that had ever gotten it. And then all of a sudden, you know, here, here I am, I find out that myself and, and one other startup uh, person um, uh, had won and um, eight other women who were just phenomenally accomplished and just amazing women. And, and most of them I had absolutely had, you know, like, uh, fangirl kind of things for in the in the local ecosystem. So I was really excited about that. Um, and then I had found out that year I had been nominated in 2017 for 40 under 40. And I was like, well, that's kind of funny. I didn't get 40 under 40, but I got top 10 women. Hmm. So I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting. So, um, and then in 2018, uh, I, you know, that was the year that I, um, I did get to, to receive the award. It was really significant. Um, you know, having, having the ability to have my, like my husband there and my father there. And then my entire team at Tiller, uh, which was the company that I had founded. Um, they came and they had, uh, little signs of my faces (laughs) and like they were cheering me on. And so I had 20 people in the audience that literally had like these little fan looking things of my face everywhere. So, um, and I didn't know that they were doing it and I had no idea. And they made that year, they made us walk a runway to a song it sounds really really awkward and it was really awkward but you had 40 people that yes we're all considered young professionals however they were making us do a catwalk and majority of the the people on you know that won 40 under 40 that year uh were men so watching grown men walk to whatever song (laughs) was a bit awkward but it was a really um a really really tremendous fun event um, you know, I, I feel very honored to be a part of this community and to be recognized by the community. I think, you know, my job as an entrepreneur is to build value, right? Like that's, that's, that's the number one thing. And it, and it doesn't matter what capacity that, um, I'm doing it at any given time, as long as I'm building value and for that to be recognized, I think that's really significant. So, um, definitely, uh, a fun experience to say the least. The, uh, I was sitting here going through as you were talking to me, walking a catwalk, um, I'll have to say that there's nothing in my life that has prepared me to think 
Um, what's my walk going to look like? Yeah. Did you get to pick the song or was it all the same song? So we got to pick the song, but we really didn't understand that it was a true catwalk till we like showed up for the awards and we're like, oh wow, that's legit in the middle of a giant room. And they, at that time, you know, obviously this is pre-COVID 2018. So you had, I don't know, maybe 5,000 people in the room with you too. So it was like an insane scenario. So what happened when you knew it was, so you thought you just maybe walk up to the stage with the song. Yeah. So what went through your mind? Was it one of those things where your mind just sat down like, oh my gosh, do I really have to do this? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, You know, and I, you know, you, you have fun with it and luckily um, I was not, the first to walk so at least you kind of figured out exactly what people were going to do how crazy they were going to be how choreographed or whatever you know because you picked out your song but like you didn't know um you know really really anything that was going to happen so in that kind of business though in that entrepreneurship oh yeah right oh yeah just go with it right yeah like (laughs) oh well i might look bad but here we go Exactly. exactly um so explain to us since 2018 what uh, things that have happened. I know we've had COVID. At yeah. some point, I mean, it's still so much of a part of our lives. At some point, we'll stop. That'll be the big thing we're talking about. I, I don't know, right? Yeah. Because we've got to move on. Mm-hmm. We have to find a way to get back to business and and to really engage with the community and, I mean, build these um, atmospheres and these things that we dream in our mind. Yeah. We've got to get back to it. But since 2018, I'll say 18 to COVID. Right. What was that year? What were you doing? Woo. So, um, I, I, I guess you have to t- kind of take a bit of a step back to, to take that step forward in my, in my path, so to speak, mm-hmm. never linear. Um, but in 2015 I had founded a uh, teller, which was a mobile app that connected job seekers to companies on demand. So we had looked at the contingent workforce wanting to create something that, um, really could answer the call where we were seeing the peer to peer market boom with up or with, uh, you know, companies like, um, you know, Uber or Lyft or Postmates or any of those, they were all peer to peer. It was, I'm a person that wants to do some kind of gig and I'm, you know, going to do it for you. Mm-hmm. And the the theory was, wait a minute, why isn't there really anything out there that was answering the call from a business to individual standpoint? And and so building that mobile app um, started in 2015 and, and kind of grew and, and scaled from, uh, we did our beta test here in Cincinnati and then scaled to 32 cities across America. So um, really a tremendous opportunity, such a great experience. Um, and, you know, that was my passion for, gosh, five years. It was, it was what I lived and breathed. It was talking about the contingent workforce, talking about how to serve those that are underserved or underrepresented. How do you, how do you put people up in a way uh, so that they can get jobs where it's not, they're not being relegated by a a resume or um, an applicant tracking system that's made to eliminate you or a job board that's made to eliminate you, right? Um, building something that was just very much focused on inclusivity, um, where, you know, when we made matches, it was based on skills. Do you have the skills? Does it match to the requirements of the job? And then our individuals were getting push notifications for offers, not interviews, offers. So that was what I lived and breathed, um, for almost, you know, five full years. And over time, you know, really, I think what happened for me personally was that I was starting to see um, new passions bloom in areas that I didn't expect. And I think that this is so normal for any entrepreneur, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's not that, uh, well, it is partially that we like to chase squirrels, right? Like, we're like, Ooh, oh, look, oh, look, oh, look, right? <laughs> and it wasn't so much that I wanted to chase another squirrel. It was more, wait a minute, um, you know, what I sought out to do was really um, level the playing field and help individuals get great opportunities. Um, I really wanted to show that transferable skills would actually be a part of an equation where I thought, you know what, you know, just because you haven't had a job title before doesn't mean that you're not qualified for it. And that theory never really got to play out because where our clients were going was mostly in the blue collar sector. And a lot of the job opportunities were, we were given weren't um, anything that really had to have a, you know, um, a lot of skills to really execute. And so for me, it was like, ah, that, you know, that, that theory, that thesis that I had originally, that spark, um, you know, wasn't getting tested, wasn't getting validated. So that was kind of a, a, bit, a big, 
a big challenge. I got really excited about building um, partnerships to help with independent worker rights and understanding, you know, the future of work and where it was going to go. I used to always say there's going to be a crisis in 2020 and all of my decks said it. And literally, I was like, I did not. You missed it by a year. I, oh, no. I, I, well, I, unfortunately, <laughs> I nailed it to the damn day, it feels like. Yeah. But it was, it was a crisis ahead. And I, I kept talking about where all of the sudden this, this you know, feeling of value mm-hmm. and what you provide to a company is going to change. And people are going to want more and more and more control. And you know, when you said people, who are the people that want like to control? The, yeah, the, the wor- workers, work, work, the, the workforce, workforce in general. Yeah. It's not even. Um, it's not. It's not. Uh, you know, just a industry or a vertical or a generation. It's a human being. Human beings want control over their life. They don't want to feel um, that the majority of their time spent on Earth is is basically determined by a boss mm-hmm. or an organization, right? And I I knew that the you know, the contingent workforce was going to grow. It was going to accelerate. And hell, even in 2020, at the end of the day, there was a 22% increase in contingent work workforce work being done. Um, it's now at $1.2 trillion a year. So that's a huge, huge number, um, even with everything that happened in the pandemic. So for me, it was okay. I couldn't test my theory of what I wanted to do. I was seeing this emergence of, you know, the contingent workforce was was getting bigger and, and better, and that was a part of what I predicted, but where I was probably wrong in some assumptions was that companies did want to work with the contingent workforce, but they wanted to work it in the parameters by which they felt was safe for them, right? And so you, know, I had that. I also had a really big passion for education and how um, you know we have to become lifelong learners um, as a society because technology is accelerating so fast that we, we're never going to keep up with it. So how do you how do you build for the future of work if you're not um, leading from within and saying, okay, well, just because you don't have a skill set doesn't mean that you can't gain it. So, so, so being the lifelong learner. Yeah. So what does that mean? So you're sitting here talking to Mark and, you know, we're sitting sitting down a group of four or five people around a bonfire. You're like, hey, you got to be a lifelong learner. Yeah. What's that mean? What's that look like? So for me, I think, um, you know, when I, I, I usually talk to people, I'm like, so what are you geeking out about right now? That's what it is. That's, that's lifelong learning right there, right? Like, what are you excited to learn about? What are you like, you know, if you go on a rabbit hole right now, when you're doing a Google search, what's that rabbit hole usually about? And, um, finding new areas that continuously interest us. Cause I think that, and I, I felt fallen, um, prey to it even if, when I was specifically more in corporate roles. Um, was like you just kind of keep honing your own skills over and over again and kind of in the same vertical or same business or same area. But then all of a sudden, um, I think entrepreneurship specifically has kind of blossomed where I'm like, ooh, I would love to learn about crypto or blockchain or things that might not be in applicable to my day-to-day life right this second, but I feel like they're having a major impact on society. So I want to learn about it. Um, so that's what, you know, usually those conversations look like. It's not, you know, like you got to go to school forever. <laughs> it's, right. it's what are you, what are you getting excited to learn about or what's in, intriguing you or interesting you right now? So through all the, the journey and we'll stay on that journey yeah. and we get back to it from 2015, but, um, how do you know when not to chase the squirrel? Like, how do you know when to be patient to stop and stick yeah. with this thing to let it evolve? Right. It does, with how technology is evolving and how fast, like when yeah. do we know? I don't know if you always do. I think now, um, I, you know, for me personally, I think I, I really chase my energy and it sounds really kind of weird and obscure, but like I, you know, we've all heard that, you know, chase your passion or, or do what you love and you'll never, you know, work a day in your life and that, that kind of thing. And for me, it's never, it's never really played out like that. It's been, um, what, what am I giving my kind of discretionary energy towards? What, what do I do on a day-to-day basis where I grind away and I look up at the clock and I'm shocked how late it is, right? It's the, it's those moments that I think, um, to me are very indicative of leaning in to more of that, uh, that endeavor, um, and not continuing to look around. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the way that I looked at it. So, you know, for me, um, in 2019, you know, I had, um, gone into kind of, uh, you know, discussions to sell the business, 
Um, I was working with, you know, my board on selling it. I had a channel partner that potentially, you know, was looking to acquire and we were working with a great firm to also kind of look and, uh, you know, sell the, sell the business. Um, but you know, I, I just saw bigger opportunities than where, where I knew my own business was going to go. And part of that is, I mean, that's determined partially by you, but really, you know, when you have a board and, you know, you have investors, their, their voice is very loud as well. So you have to take those things into consideration. And, you know, it was about, uh, you know, late 2019 where I was like, you know, I think that where I'm getting really excited and geeked out about doesn't align to where I think this, that my own business is going to go. And I think it's time to, to look to move on. Yeah. Um, so you saw it. I mean, you gave five years of this thing, yeah, right? Absolutely. And so you, you were able to spend enough time to flush out mm-hmm. really the evolution of you yep. and then where you saw the business going. So before we move on from that, but the business that you started um, from 2015, so mm-hmm. I'm an employer. I think this is how you can help so many people. So if, yeah. if Mark comes to you and I said, hey, whether you're doing this now or not, but if I'm looking for, I think this is going to be a huge obstacle for most businesses now is Mm -hmm. people re-entering the workforce from being laid off from being furloughed and I've just talked to so many people that haven't worked for over a year that have all the degrees Mm -hmm. have all the experience they're uncomfortable going back to work right so and that's going to be something where even if me and you are like hey you know go down this entrepreneurial path like what you know set out on your dream and Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are going to go back to traditional employment Mm -hmm. so what do you tell that company who's looking to grow that needs to hire 200 people to fill these roles as they see them yeah what advice do you give them to fill them how how should they approach the workforce now Mm -hmm. is that still something that's on your mind and we're going to talk about what you're doing now but what advice would you give me so, yes, I mean, I've been in HR tech for nearly 20 years. So I, I, I think workforce planning and, and workforce engagement and talent um, is just now in my DNA at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- what I what I have talked to a lot of business owners, you know, executives, corporate, you know, every 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 kind of walk of life. Mm-hmm. And I think for us now, we're going to go into and we already are seeing this. We're going to go into one of the hottest job markets we've probably ever experienced. I agree. I don't know why I agree, but I do. And <laughs> you know more and, about it than I do. But. And I think that um, it's the perfect storm, right? You've got um, you've got a couple of macro trends that have occurred. You've got a huge exodus of baby boomers that have left the workforce, and many are under the sixty-five year old mark, right? Like mm-hmm. they're there's that that's ma- that mass exodus you've got uh, many individuals that are choosing not to work in the workforce at all altogether they've now decided not to in some way shape or form so they've just exited altogether and then the kind of the other side of the equation is that um, technology was accelerated by COVID it didn't slow it down so innovation's happening um, technology acceleration's happening we have a lower workforce participation rate And so now we're going to see this hot and heavy scenario where companies are just going to be hiring so quickly. And the number one thing that I would tell any organization is that your workforce will not look like it did pre-COVID. You will not have a workforce that is 100% employee based. It's going to have to be made up of those that are independent in some way, shape or form. If that's going to be going through uh, kind of a staffing outlet, awesome. If that's going to be independent contractors or fractional executives or fractional hires, that's great as well. Um, but the, the main thing that I would say is that you have to get really comfortable with hybrid and that's hybrid workforce. That's hybrid work, you know, location or destiny environment. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to be really, really good about creating a very intentional organization and intentional culture and intentional environment. Um, So that you can support all types of work, all types of worker and give parity between it. No longer is it okay to say, oh, don't worry, I I hired a temp and, you know, whatever, let's throw them aside. It's like, no, no, no. These are actual like they're choosing not to be your employee, Mm -hmm. um, but they're still choosing to do great work for you. So you have to be very thoughtful about that entire process. I think that's actually going to be more difficult for organizations that have existed for 10 or 15 or 20 years yeah. versus a startup. Mm-hmm. 100%. Right? It's going to be really weird. So this startup environment, um, you have a ton of experience there as well. Yeah, right? Absolutely. And what advice, 
would you give to like don't you love these questions yeah. like what advice would you give to this person that thinks they want to go out on this endeavor of creating a startup Woo, that's a big one so number one i would say look at your support system do you have support because it there are some dark days many dark days I think in the beginning right or lonely days I should say mm -hmm. and um, you need to under understand that you you're going to have to have um, the ability to bounce ideas off of people that have been through the journey doesn't matter if they've been on your journey uh, that they've been through that journey otherwise you're going to find yourself giving up a lot quicker than you would have intended to so for me personally you know as a tech entrepreneur uh, and a female, it was really, really difficult starting this journey. And um, the only way I made it through some of the trials and tribulations, the ups and downs is that, you know, I had a group of uh, other female founders that were also leading tech companies. And we all s said, wait a minute, um, you know, how do we do this thing called the startup world and be moms and, you know, scale our dreams and our visions when everything around us has been made really for men to do it. Right. And so we started we uh, meeting every two weeks and supporting one another and, you know, having each other on speed dial and, and having our little, you know, our, our group that could support one another because we had been, we'd all been through it. So, um, you know, I established that with my group pretty early on. Um, and that was an absolute saving grace. Now, if, if I wouldn't have had that, I probably would have walked away many times earlier on, um, just because I didn't have that sounding board or that outlet that had walked a mile, so to speak in my shoes. Was it more about having, um, those women going through what you were going through? Was it about having them, um, they've already been there in the past or was it just having someone that truly had your back? Like, do one and two not even matter? You just need positive reinforcement. Um, I think all three. I don't think, you know, and, and I will say um, having having the psychological safety to have those hard conversations with someone and actually have uh, have those conversations and say, hey, guys, I'm feeling really rough about this. I don't know. I'm going to give up. And then say, yeah, like, I can see why that would be really tough. I would probably give up too. But here's what I know to be true about you or having those really transparent conversations and, and having it where you feel like you maybe, I don't know, been wronged in some way and have them, you know, say, no, I think you might be looking at it a little different. And here's how I see it. Is that, could that be something? So having that transparency and that trust with a, with a group of, of people that are going through it. And most of them had already, you know, went through it in the past was also great. So it's important to have a safe environment. Yeah. 100%. Right, where you can feel like, Hey, I really want honest feedback. Absolutely. I want to share like the honesty inside of me. Cause I think that's where yeah. we're so scared of judgment these days. I don't know why, <laughs> yes. but we are. And yeah. if we could just open our mind and have a growth mindset, but you do have to have people around you that not only trust, but the care. A hundred percent. Right. Absolutely. Um, we've kind of found the same thing. So what else? I know they're very general statements, but everyone thinks they have a great idea. Yeah. They're not all. Because the marketplace no. tells us, right? Of course, of course. So what do you do? So you just try anyway and just accept the failure if it happens, and yeah. Well, I, I and and I've you know I definitely am somebody that's a, a growth mindset kind of person. So I definitely look at things and say, okay, if I'm going to try it, I'm either going to learn, or I and that's going to help accelerate my growth later in life, or I'm going to learn and my business is going to be validated, right? Yep. So I think that um, especially in the startup world, I think you have to. You know, because I always get asked, especially um, especially women, actually, they'll they'll say, how did you know when to leave or when to jump? And I'm like, you don't really know ever, but you will have a moment where you're like, wow, this is this is my life. OK, I got it. I, I know. And it's and it's one of those things that most entrepreneurs I've talked to. They said that they remember that moment where they were just going to go go for it. And they did it right. Um, but there's so many ways that you can test you know, test your products, test your theories, test your business models, get feedback, you know, find those people that you do trust in your, you know, in your life and, and get that honest feedback about what you really want to build or scale. Right. Um, I think that that's, you know, kind of the best opportunity, you know, as, as you're kind of starting on the endeavor, um, you can somewhat dip your toes in, into this without, um, worrying about, you know, any kind of shame or guilt or, uh, you know, um, rough feedback you've got to get got to get used to it so you might as well do it before you, you fully jump ship right yeah 100 percent. so what do i can just tell sitting here talking to you that 
you have so much experience in your brain. You could just sit down and just have <laughs> so many of these conversations because you're probably firing off on like 10 different experiences every time you're sharing something. But um, so I saw something on LinkedIn that you liked. And uh huh. <laughs> hey, it's not all about just what we follow. It's oh, what I we know, like. I know. I um, know. So it was an article about um, startups in the Midwest versus yeah. on the coast 100%. and getting those funded. And that people in the Midwest, these startups that were at a disadvantage a little bit. Is that true or no? Like, what's your opinion of that? This is a, yeah, it's definitely a topic I could I could talk for a while about. So I think that there are some really interesting advantages that we have here. Um, Cincinnati is one of the best places, I think, to start an organization. Um, you know, we have access to people that... Uh, those that are on the coast only dream of. I mean, you know, we've got this, you know, concentration of Fortune 500 companies. We've got um, this growing e-commerce world that's around us. We've got um, healthcare that's going great, financial, you know, consumer packaged goods. You've got a lot of industries that are really uh, growing and scaling here and have. And because of being Midwesterners, typically it's not hard to get meetings, right? Like not that... Um, not that that's the only thing that you need, but at the end of the day, the fact that you can get, you know, somebody's ear for a little bit is great, right? And we all want to see each other successful. So you have this kind of um, mentality that the, you know, kind of um, the the ecosystem will support you in some way, shape, or form. Now, where I do see a disadvantage is that um, prior to COVID, now I think that some of this is going to get corrected because of COVID, which is interesting. Um, many that were seeking uh, venture capital funds um, typically in the coast, they like to do business really, really central to where they're located. It's because they don't want to jump on a plane. They don't want to do that, the hustle and bustle. They want to be able to go and talk to their founders when they want, where they want. Right. Mm -hmm. And they know that they can get in their car and drive to it. Right. And so that, um, had been somewhat of a, a challenge, right. Um, you know, it was interesting when um, you know, Teller got an award from VentureBeat as a top 10 startup out of Silicon Valley. And part of what they were doing is they were just really trying to highlight startups that weren't in the coasts. And then we got to kind of come together with the other startups and go out to an event in Reno, Nevada. And, you know, they're kind of, um, you know, they're obviously outside of the uh, outside of the valley, but, you know, they've got things like Burning Man that are going on in their backyard, right? Like they've got some interesting things going on. And we had these conversations and it and it did come back to like, wow, you can get a meeting over at Procter and Gamble and you can walk, walk down the street and you you're you've got it that's awesome um but I'm like well at the end of the day when's the last time Andreessen Horowitz came out to Cincinnati and invested you know a hundred million dollars like they do all day every day probably <laughs> never if they have it's been once right 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 a hundred percent so yes. I think that the, you know there's there's some good and bad I think the probably now the bigger challenge is um isn't so much starting up the support to start up we've got that i think that that um in the midwest that we're super strong there i think commercialization and scale has been a challenge and um i think it's because we don't have enough of enough founders that have been able to to go at it long enough because they haven't had access to the capital and if they haven't had access how do they how do they go into growth mode or hyper growth mode um, so I, I'm, I'm excited to see that part of the equation get solved. You know, some of our, our counterparts in other cities like Indianapolis or Columbus or even Cleveland are starting to see some of that. Um, and the more we see successes, the more the money comes, the more the opportunity, the more that we see the talent uh, that have been through it will scale. But also, like I said, I think COVID's going to help even the playing field some somewhat. Because of virtual meetings? Yeah. Yeah. So hyper growth, what does that mean? At what percentage growth year over year? Or what is, what's hyper growth? Yeah, I think it all depends on the, the industry. industry. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, you know, 100% plus year over know, year. Month over month is usually what you're looking for. I mean, See, it's that's not, not Midwestern year over year. speak. That's yeah, not that's, Midwestern speed. No, I was like, year over year isn't a thing. I mean, you you've got to do quarter over quarter, month over month. So how long does <laughs> week that over have, week. how long does that have to go on for? Um, is it twelve months? Is it eighteen months? I mean, when do VCs yeah. start looking? So I it, I mean, if you if you're doing some crazy numbers, they look they look fast. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a couple of of good founders locally that um, you know, the the former founder of Dot Loop that mm -hmm. sold to Zillow, Nelson, you know Nelson. now. Yeah, now now they've got Picasso, and Picasso just got a billion dollar valuation, and 
Um, you know, unfortunately, they left. They really kind of left the Midwest. Now we do have a couple of people here locally that um, are going to keep that, you know, that bad boy running uh, hard and fast, and we'll probably um, have some good wins out of the Cincinnati market because of it. But um, you know, we've got to we've got to get these founders up and running and make sure that they don't leave our backyard. Or if they do leave, they boomerang back because right, <laughs> right. we need them. Yeah, because the they knowledge. say, "Hey, it's just better there." <laughs> um, I wonder if so. How much do we want? Like our selfish area, I love Cincinnati. Yeah. All the traveling. I just got back from Texas a, a week long, just seeing all the cities and the growth there. Yeah. And um, it's crazy. I went to Austin and there were between 11, 11 and 13 cranes downtown. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just nuts. It's yeah. like that was Boston level. Like Austin, Texas is not a huge city. No, not at all. It's a million. And we're a million six in Cincinnati yeah. and all the area. Yeah. They're a million max. Right. But it'll probably be three or four in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Absolutely. But so um, so we want to talk about this great story about Cincinnati, but selfishly to live, I don't want them all to come. Right. <laughs> so how do we how do we balance this? Right. Can right. we? And then I go to Houston, and there's 7 or 8 million, mm -hmm. and it just felt to my Midwest brain, 7 or 8 million people in that city was, I, I had to mentally adjust for a day or two. Because, oh, sure. right, it was rush hour at 11 p.m. So I don't know. It was just it was wild, and then you would go on the streets, and it just the hustle and bustle. Um, you just didn't notice people. It was right. it was different and weird. So do we really want this? Yeah, I, I I think I mean selfishly we do from you know financial gain for all of us. But yeah, there are some implications to that, right? Like all, I mean, we're all kind of seeing what it's like when the housing market is crazy hot and fast. We're seeing it, it's been insane for the last year, right? Mm -hmm. um, year plus. So I think that there's um, there's some good and bad with that, right? Like, And I, I would love to get, get all of us out of the Cincinnati no, because that is something I think the startup world, it's just, it's rough, right? Like, so what is that, the Cincinnati the, no? The Cincinnati no is everyone will take a meeting with you, but when it comes to actually moving forward with a sales order or a contract or a partnership or an engagement or an investment. It's the Cincinnati. No, it just, it's, it's uh, not a maybe not a now there's no, no, it's just, we'll meet later. Let's, let's have another meeting. You let's have that, another you know drink. Let's, yeah. Someone else is going to slip in while <laughs> right. that's happening. Right. So right. why does that happen? I mean, why was it yeah. what you were talking about before that maybe you just don't have the face to face awareness or the opportunity of meetings? I mean, is it that simple? Part of that, well, and and, and for, uh, you know, for Cincinnati, it's 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 most most organizations are willing to meet with the startups locally too. Yeah, it's just doing actual business, getting actual contracts is usually where we see the biggest challenge, right? Um, and and most every founder I've ever talked to, they're like, I don't even waste my time in the backyard because. I'm not going to make, you know, huge revenue gains off of off of, you know, 17 meetings with the same group. Right. So, so where does this thing go now? You almost if you're not capable of having a billion dollar valuation, right. they don't want to talk to you. Right. For sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's this vicious, vicious cycle. So, you know, I think that more and more of the founders are going outside of, you know, the region. Number one. You have to if you if you need anything, um, you know, of, of, a, of a significant level from mm -hmm. an investment point of view. Um, you also need to go outside of of kind of the area because you need a valuation that also looks um, at least uh, somewhat appetizing or or relevant to what you're, you know, you're kind of growing. So um, I think some of some of what we're learning now is we have to go outside of our backyard, but we're all so passionate about our region. I know. Right. And we're all like, please, let's just correct it. But I think the way, you know, we, we're going to go outside of our walls, right, and, and do what we do. And as we have success, we bring it back home. So that's that's what we're going to have to do to, to really start to see um, some shifts. So I think um, it's really weird. I won't talk about the exact industry, but I was, I've been engaging with a company that likes um, participating with startups. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really a business to business it was just it was a resource we were going to use and I was having conversations with them and they're like well you know it was like this well a midwestern real estate company uh you know it's just not but here's what's funny that was six months ago and two weeks ago I get an email mm -hmm. and they say hey are you still interested <laughs> and I did some research on their company and they recently um, had another $140 million invested in their company. Oh, wow. And so now they have to find more growth. So maybe a byproduct of this, all this money in the system now mm -hmm. is, maybe some of these markets that previously 
weren't hot and right in front of them, maybe because of that combined yeah. with COVID, that they're going to be opened up searching for other opportunities. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. And I didn't have that thought until a couple weeks ago. I went, hmm, I stopped reaching out. Right. And all of a sudden the email shows up and they were aggressive when I interacted. And within two weeks, this thing I was trying to put together, it's put together. Hmm. Interesting. Really, really weird. So, yeah. um, so I don't know. And, th- and this isn't a company that traditionally engages with non-startup, um, huge valuation companies. Like the company I run, we've been around for 13 years. Right. It just wasn't on the radar. So, <laughs> um, so since 2019, what has your world looked like in this? Everything that your brain knows and all your experience yeah. that brings you now. Mm-hmm. What's it looked like since 2019? Now, what you can talk about. Yeah, it's been um, interesting, probably from a personal perspective. You know, it was a it was a challenging year. I mean, not that everybody didn't go through challenges, um, but we had some pretty uh, significant things. Um, a lot of people that we lost this past year, um, you know, and uh, that that actually probably shook me up a lot more than I probably wanted to admit. <laughs> early on. Um, and, and so I'm trying to be very empathetic for, for my, uh, you know, my team and, and to others around me. Um, and I'm usually not somebody that will admit, uh, very freely that I've, I've had some challenges or struggles. Um, you know, my, my husband deployed like a month after we got married and I missed my entire first year of marriage cause he was in combat. So like, so I'm resilient. You're used I, to being yeah, resilient. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So I'm, I'm really used to it, but I, you know, now I can, you know, hindsight's really interesting, like being able to look back and being like, wow, okay. Like, you know, 20, 20, the very end of 2019 into 20, all of 2020 was, was a beast to say the least. I mean, I had my mother-in-law committed suicide. I had, uh, I lost my father-in-law not too long after that. Um, we lost four, four more family members between uncles and cousins. And then, you know, I left my own startup which is crazy to do. And then, you know, we had a big move and I just, it's just a lot. It compounded a lot. And, you know, for me, I'm normally one of those people that just, I lean into my work and I've always been like that. And, um, to have to like slow down number one, because we're forced and we were like locked down. That's number one, right? Like we were locked down. So there's that. But like to slow down at all and like be able to like say, oh shit, this would normally break a human. (laughs) Right. Yes. I was like a little shocked. Yeah. Like, and now I'm like looking back like, okay, I didn't break, but man, it's, it's been a, it's been a a rough couple of months. So do you think that all that you're going, I I just sat here and listened and there's just so many, like you have sympathy Mm -hmm. for what so many people have gone through and that, you know, there's people just suffering in the world. And I just heard what you went through over the past 14, 15 months. Three things. Like, if there's three things that are the most difficult mentally, emotionally to deal with in life. Moves, job change, and close to death. Yep. Those three things. And they're all compounded to 15 months on top of you not being able to go to the thing, work, right. that you always fell back on. Yep. Um, what gives you hope? Um... You know, I, I, I obviously I can say, you know, I have a seven year old son and that's, that's, that's what you lean in on. And I have um, an amazing husband and especially after he was injured in Iraq to be able to like, look at that and say, wow, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely very, very, um, happy and grateful for that. So that's always, you know, what I default to. Um, but I, I also look around at others and I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, like I, I have it, I'm so, so blessed and lucky, lucky to be here and to, to go through like what I went through. Um, you know, everything I look at is a lesson to me. Like I said, we were, we, we, you know, had, it's going to make you stronger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm like, how damn strong do I need to be? Right. In (laughs) in the moment, one of those moments in the moment, it just doesn't feel like that. No. Right. And and then this, to have this entrepreneurial mind that you have, Yeah. it's probably, it's probably like firing all the time. Right. Like what's next? Where am I going to be? Yes. Uh, what should I do? So inside of you, do you yeah. feel like what's up next? Do I need to get at this thing again? Like, how are you feeling coming out of all this, all the challenges and stuff you've had in your life? Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, in the, in the space and, you know, moved on to, um, you know, building and scaling talent now, and I'm still doing that. Um, but I definitely, I, I think that the, probably the, the fun blessing of being an entrepreneur is that you see opportunity everywhere, right? Like there's never 
there's never a moment where I don't look around and I'm like, ooh, that's a problem that could be solved. Squirrel. Doesn't doesn't mean I want <laughs> right? to solve it yes. by any in any way, shape, or form, but I do keep notes on like silly things that I'm like, this should be solved for. I'm not gonna solve it. But if somebody ever came to me, I can give them twenty five ideas at any given time and say, Hey, here's a bunch of businesses you could go after. Um, I'm not passionate about many of them, but that doesn't mean that they are not fabulous problems to solve for. The uh, this this passion thing that you just touched on, um, I love to have this conversation around. I'm starting to check my opinion more. I just have <laughs> to because opinions, right? We all have them. Yep. Um, so this idea of passion, um, you hear some of the most successful business people speak to this idea that um, you know you need to find your passion. Right. You need to find the thing that really inspires you and drives you and go do that. Yeah. What's your idea behind that? I gave, I, I don't want to say I gave up on passion. I get, I, I leaned into energy. So that's, that's what any, any intern I've ever talked to any, you know, uh, even employees that I, you know, have looked to either hire or have hired, you know, I, I always talk about like what gives you energy and that's usually where I find their passion. Like it, it's not, it has nothing to do with, Hey, name your passion. It's more, Okay, let's let's talk about what gives you energy. Like what if like tell me your perfect day. Like what's it look like? And that's usually where I can find it in, in most people, right? Um but yeah, I, I I hear all the gurus that are out there, especially now that, you know, we've got the the new audio kind of social medias popping up like Clubhouse and just hearing, you know, some of the the cheesiest stuff that you would ever hear and you're like I really hope no impressionable young person is listening right now because that is horrible advice. Don't um, yeah, don't you wonder? So I sit back and I am I'm, I'm not going to share my opinion, but here's what happens in my mind. I'm like, how did they ever operate and really build anything with that mindset? Right. I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm and so I just stop listening sometimes. Oh yeah. Right. And sure. and and I'm like I'm not even going to dig into it because yeah. I don't know. It's not that I'm. The challenge is is to have these ideals in our mind, the way things should mm-hmm. operate, and still being willing to listen to others. But sometimes you hear things, it's just like, that just shook my head. What are you even talking about? Right, um, right, right. I don't know. I don't know how much to listen to people that have come before us right? and to still but be open-minded that something needs to change and do it again. Absolutely. Well, I, I think um, I lean into disruption and change. Mm-hmm. I thrive on it. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, and, Why? And it's it's uh, the variety in life right like it's it's that part of of that you know like there's still so like I said there's so many industries that I I geek out about already like that I like you know I have friends that are starting cool businesses and I'm like dang that's a really cool fun place like I've got friends that are in augmented reality or virtual reality or you know that they you know they're talking about holograms teaching and like I'm like what that is awesome like so cool I'm like I've been talking about talent for so long I'm like you I I, I get excited for other people and what they're doing but um yeah I, I mean I thrive on change I thrive on um you know getting disrupting disrupting and and having uh new experiences I think it's you know, it's fun. I think I, I yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good with disruption, sometimes for disruption sake. That's what I'm wondering. So, <laughs> so that's it, right? Does it feed this madness inside of us? Yes. Um, do you think that uh, is disruption, is disruption good for the market? I think so. I think so. I think, um, you know, it, it, we're just, our, our world is not what it was. And I think that that's going to be probably the biggest challenge that most people coming out of, of what we've known as the last year or the pandemic, the last year has been really uh, it, it's caused a lot of introspection, I think, with a lot of people and trying to figure out what they value and, and what what do they cherish. I think it, it was a good pause for a lot of us to like reflect on life and understand like, oh, I really need to lean into this or I need to get away from that. Um, that's why I think turnover is going to be insane this year um, because so many people just hunkered down and stayed with their organizations. But then this year they're going to be like, no, no, no. I need to find things that are lining up. And that's why I think entrepreneurship is also going to be pretty big uh, coming out as well. Happens in nearly every recession or every, every, you know, major cyclical, you know, challenge that we've seen. Um, Are we mentally prepared to deal with, because with massive entrepreneurship is going to come with massive um, startups that the market rejects. Are we mentally as a society, society prepared to deal with that? I think so. I I do. I do think so. So I will say this. There's one thing that I wish as a Midwesterner that we would learn that we just don't have a part of our culture yet. And that is that, you know, if you go to a Silicon Valley, 
Um, failure is a badge of honor. It is not looked at like this big, nasty, hairy thing, like that you fell flat on your face or whatever. I mean, it could be, you know, whatever it happens to be. They never look at failure as like this horrible thing. People gobble those types of people up because they're like, they've already learned all the lessons. Let's keep them. Let's grab them, like hunt them down. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that's a that's an area that the Midwest really needs to start to think through and lean into. Mm hmm. Maybe we're listening to all the people we care about that live traditional lives so much. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe a little bit too much. Yeah. We love them and they love us, but they just don't know how to, you know, tell us to go chase our dreams that way. Right. 100%. Right? The, um, so does purpose matter inside this startup world? Does purpose matter? Or yeah. is it around a billion dollar valuation? Does it, does it even matter the company? Um, I think it, it depends on the entrepreneur, right? And the idea. Um, I think that there are more, let's say, from my own experience, I'll say, um, I see more entrepreneurs that do find purpose in what they're doing. And that's why they're chasing the dream. I I find more purpose driven than not. Now, that's not to say that there are not entrepreneurs that are just chasing that egoic unicorn, right? And there's the blend in between. Right, yeah. A hundred percent. There's this blend of like, and I mean... I can be the most purpose-driven person on earth, but, you know, I still have stuffed animals of unicorns all over my office. (laughs) I mean, or unicorn anything, right? Like, I still have it top of mind for me. So Mm -hmm. you can, you can be very purpose, you know, you can marry your person, your, 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 your purpose with your passion and, and still help your pocketbook, so to speak. Um, so does culture matter? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, so I, it's something that I've, um, been really kind of researching and trying to understand, especially as AI has become, and machine learning has become so prevalent and it's going to only increase because you've, like I said, we're in this perfect storm of not even having enough people to do the jobs that we need them to do. So we're going to have to innovate and now the robots are going to be around, right? Mm -hmm. So as you think through it, you know, culture has to be a huge part of, of building a great organization and building great teams. Um, But as we think about culture fit, I, I do have a, I, I have a, a problem and or I would challenge anybody that talks just about culture fit because with diversity and inclusion, you need to look at culture ad. You know, it's not about having this homogenized group of people that look and act the same. You have to have diversity in the, in the way of thinking. And that can be diversity and there's there's so much different types of diversity out there that we have to we have to grow our our own understanding of that right um so i think culture is absolutely important but that doesn't mean culture fit or similarity needs to be important i think that we have we have an evolution that's going to have to come yeah that's and, what i'm sitting here thinking about i'm like yeah. how does that happen yeah. because if culture matters and there's companies that have so if you walk into a company of 500 mm-hmm. and 490 of them will love it and they want a best place to work and all this. And that culture, that's how we've... Like, people love to show up and work there every day. Yeah. How can you convince them that they need to be open to that culture changing? So I don't think it's a, a open to a culture change as much as expanding the definitions of, of what the company values, right? I think that you can define a company and the culture based on what they value and where, where they put their money and treasure and, and thought around, right? So, like, when you think about... Um, why certain organizations do really well, a lot of times it's they've invested into the people. Mm -hmm. And that's been the primary area by which they excel, right? Mm -hmm. Because people that have been invested in are happy. They're going to do great business. They're going to want to serve. So I think that it's, it's expanding, um, and helping the, the organization, you know, kind of define the values that they're going to live and breathe by and then understand, okay, as long as values kind of line up, you diversity can also line up to that. Right. So, um, and we're in an interesting time, right? We're all learning all about how to, how to make more inclusive work, you know, workplaces, how to, um, even have a conversation about psychological safety and empathy and having EQ. I mean, gosh, like two years ago, that was barely even talked about, um, on the mainstream and now it is. Yeah. We were talking what, probably a few weeks ago, Mike to uh, Michelle Dickinson, she previously worked, it was a what top 50, it was Johnson and Johnson. And she now is a entrepreneur about mental health within the workplace. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love that and topic. so um, I think we talked for 30 or 40 minutes and, um, you know, it. you have to stop and be willing to listen to 
people that are figuring out ways for us to do this better and be open-minded to grow and think differently because as entrepreneurs who are working 80, 90 to 100 hours a week, you're not really stopping to think different. You're just grinding, right? Yeah. Every minute. And that's not bad. It's not bad that you're just fighting to exist and to develop a thing the marketplace says yes to, but um yeah, I think maybe I think maybe the pandemic has opened our minds right. to be willing to listen to something different, right. ways that we can help people and care more and I personally agree that culture should all be about people. I, I don't right. think, yeah, we have our um, taps in our kitchen and yeah. we have our ping pong table and we have our huge <laughs> connect four. And um, so we have those things, but I don't think that's our culture. No. Like that's just something that just lets us enjoy our day a little bit. Yeah. But the culture should be all about people. A hundred percent. I I totally agree. And I, I think that that is interesting um, talking about mental health and in the workplace. That is something that, as Americans, we've never really had to like, it wasn't okay. It, it's never been something we've ever talked about. Right. Yep. And, um, you know, as mentioned, my, you know, my husband served in Iraq and I'm, you know, I, I'm very keenly aware of what the military goes through and knowing just how rough, um, that side of that equation is. And that's just one, one group of individuals that, you know, and 22 people kill themselves every day that are veterans. So like seeing that it's like, okay, well, what, what is it, what is it doing to the rest of us? You know, when we just went through something that none of us could have ever fathomed in our lifetime. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to bring our whole selves to the workplace and that has to include mental health as well. So, um, I think we're going to see some interesting evolution happen with a lot of organizations as they almost have their own culture shock where their people are telling them, no, 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 we have to do business this way. We have to build our, build our brands this way or build our, our ethos in a certain way. And it's going to be a lot of organizations changing from within first and foremost, or they're going to falter. Yep. Right. Yep. Cause I think maybe, maybe people are finally, here's one of the most baffling things to me is that, when I started, when I went on my entrepreneurial journey, um, and I'm not a startup minded person, like it's great and fascinating to hear this because I'm just a grind it, stick with it, <laughs> whatever the outcome is, right? right? So, uh, for good or bad, I don't know. Talk to me in another 10 years, I'll let you know. Right. Um, but I look around, and when I started it, I had this belief like, one of my purposes, I was like, everybody wants to change their life. I really fundamentally believed. I'm like, they see where their life currently is and they mm -hmm. want more. Mm hmm. So I haven't changed from the belief that they want a different life. But then what I found was, man, they just don't have the confidence. They don't have the self-esteem. They don't have the belief in themselves, right? right? They don't have the infrastructure around them to go do it. Maybe COVID will bring that on for so many more people. Yeah. Maybe it will to say, you know what, I'm not going to accept this life that I saw. I just know that me professionally, and it's just my little limited bubble world, if I knew what the next 10 to 15 years of my work life was going to already look like, that for me would not be a good life. Right. If I just knew, like, there's the ladder. I see the next three or four rungs. Mm -hmm. I see my 3 to 5% increases. I see the little bit of money going to the 401k. I see what retirement's going to be. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I was like, man, that is not a satisfying life. Yeah. Because all this time that we're giving to this thing, and so many people had something inside of them that they, they want more, they feel more, like there's something out there they want, they just didn't feel like it was there for them. Right. Maybe, maybe this is what's going to do that thing. I don't know. So a question I have for you. So being a woman in business mm -hmm. means so much to you. Like mm -hmm. it's so essential and so important. I hear yep. that coming out. So explain to a, a 42-year-old guy <laughs> um, that, here I'll give you just more context, that the two most imp people, important personal people in my personal life mm -hmm. are my mom and my significant other. Okay. Um, and so, and we've been together 13 years. We haven't gotten married. Um, she's a strong professional. And so those are the two people that I respect most in my life. Yeah. And so I don't look at you different. I look at you as just as capable as me. But, and so the challenging part for that is, is that does the world really look at it different than that? Or has it? Um, I think if you ask just about any other woman, <laughs> they will right. say, yes, it looks and feels very different. Okay. Um, however, I will say that I have been incredibly fortunate as a, as a woman that has had male counterparts that not only have, I, 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 it's kind of that joke of an analogy, invited me to the table. 
but not just invite me to the table, but give me a voice at the table. And, um, you know, a lot of that has made the difference, right? Like that, that's been a, a big, um, opportunity that I think I've been afforded the luxury of in my life. I mean, at the end of the day, like my mom worked at Waffle House. That was her career. Uh, she never made it past 10th grade. My dad was a steel worker at AK Steel. I grew up in a trailer park. Um, nobody in my family had ever went to college. So for me, I didn't see um, examples of what true success looked like. I saw ha- I saw hard work. I saw hustle, sometimes legal, sometimes not, <laughs> but I saw <laughs> hustle. Um, and, you know, for me, I had that drive, that drive to like, I want a better, I want something different. And I didn't see other women. So I'm like, oh, doesn't mean I can't do it. I'm just going to find the right people to align myself with and see how it shakes out. Now, I've definitely faced things, you know, from harassment to, you know, verbal abuse to you name it. I mean, I've seen it all over the years, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's unfortunate that that is a thing that, you know, women have to go through. But I I, I do feel, I feel like there's some good momentum finally. Like that we we feel somewhat, somewhat, and hopefully COVID helped as well, that there's like this collective uh, push to be better as a society. Now, I will say um, it's absolutely heartbreaking the number of women that left the workforce. Um, We've got the lowest female participation rate in the workforce as we've had since 1984, I believe was the last number I've heard. That's heartbreaking. And that will hurt society overall if we don't have more female voices at the table, just like diversity and inclusion. I mean, these are all huge macro things that we have to address as a society. So, you know, as you were mentioning, you know, you've got people that have left the workforce for a year. Mm -hmm. Well, a big majority of those are women. And, you know, we have to be very thoughtful as entrepreneurs, as business owners to not allow what we have been conditioned as a response like oh you have a gap in employment I'm not going to talk to you okay wait a minute the whole world just went through a pandemic yes there's going to be gaps in employment because people had to take care of their kids because there's no health care or uh, child care so um yeah I think that it, it's fabulous that you know you you see women as equals that's that's amazing not everybody does and I don't even think it's a, a lot of times it's conscious I think many people that I've I've, you know, had great relationships with, they, they felt like it's equal, but then sometimes things will come out of their mouth. I'm like, did you just say that? <laughs> like, that's not a thing. You're not allowed to say that. That's not okay. That's not okay. Right. That's not okay. Um, I've had, I've had an investor in the past brag about paying me less than, uh, anyone else. I'm like, you know, you're not allowed to say that, right? Like that's not okay. Um, you know, bragging about that is not, like, okay. like, like, A, why would you think it's you would want to brag about it? And then Number, you should yeah. be smart enough to know that even if you feel that way, like, why are you going to brag about it? Right. You're in front an of idiot. My face. Yeah. yeah. You're, and where'd you're you get all idiot. this money from to right. be able to fund somebody? Right. Um, 100%. So, how do, even if society's getting better, so I, I just hear this, if it's the lowest participation since 84 for females in the workforce, yeah. I'm like, if you were to give me any stat that it was any segment of the population that was their lowest engagement in 84, I was like, how the hell do you come back from that? Oh, yeah. it's Like, that's right. Because our minds are curious, and all yeah. of a sudden, I'm like, man, how do you fix it? And yeah. I'm thinking, that's enormous. It's huge. It's absolutely staggering. Um, and, and it's, you know, specifically uh, here in the U.S., right? Um, especially with, you know, women are getting more, you know, degrees than men. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, leading up to this, there was a lot of outpacing, right? Um, but yet you still have, you know, the wage gap, and now you've all of a sudden got, you know, a scenario where women are trying to get back into the workforce, but they're kind of being squished down and, you know, that. So I think, number one, disruption. How do you disrupt mm-hmm. it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Tell them all to come work for our real estate company. There you go. We want them. There you go. Everyone, <laughs> anybody anybody that wants to work in the real estate company. Any of them. Any of them. Got it. Um, I will send them all to you. <laughs> Thank all you. All two Thank million. Thank you. We need great people. Okay, perfect, perfect. All two million people. You heard it here first. You can come We have here. two amazing recruiters. <laughs> It's, it's Nicole, Tr- to two. T- t- Nicole Trimpey and Aaron Dorfman, pivotcareers.com. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. But you're seeing some interesting things come up. Um, you know, uh, Teresa Tanner, um, who's phenomenal. She she worked at Fifth Third um, and retired uh, from that part of her life and is now doing Reserve Squad. And it's, you know, finding ways that you can keep women engaged 
Um, even if they do have to take time off, like how do you have a reserve squad of women that just because they need to take time to take care of their family doesn't mean that they can't stay engaged with the company and come back, you know, stronger than ever. Like that's a, that's a way you're seeing things like the mom project that are just building and scaling so quickly. And I think that you're going to see more and more of those pop up and, and find ways to say, hold up, we've got to change the game across the board. We got here because we didn't have childcare. I mean, realistically, we weren't, we didn't have the infrastructure in place for childcare. We didn't have the infrastructure in place for um, all of us to all of a sudden be teachers who, I mean, Lord knows I was not built to be a teacher. I was built to be an entrepreneur. And that was a really, really challenging time. Thank God for my husband. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, there, there has to be a change almost as a, at a societal level to, to fix this. I mean, uh, you know, the numbers are absolutely staggering. And we also saw, you know, within the VC sector, only 2.3% of VC dollars went to women in 2020 as well on top of it. So it's like these, there's a lot of these, these numbers that, um, can be really disheartening, but I think that what I, what I would challenge anyone to think about though, is how do you correct it? Like that, and, and, you know, challenge accepted, right? Like you have to find people that are just so, um, passionate about like solving that problem that they, they come up with that next great thing that fixes it. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for a disrupt, a disruptive nature that's going to come out, out of all of this and course correct for the future for women, for sure. We're on board with it. We'll fight with you. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, Hey, what have I missed here? Is there anything happening uh, in your life, I think it's uh, <laughs> anything happening at all. No, I'm talking about like that's that you see coming out of yeah. like COVID. Like what what so you're doing, um, your talent now, yep. right? So you have that going on. Yep. You're the CEO. Um, are you always looking for that next thing? Like we talk about, Squirrel. Do you have your eye on one or two things? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, for me, where I've been doing a lot of, of advising or uh, you know board seats and things. Um, I, I definitely am highly involved within the education space. Um, that's something that I think we've got to solve for just, we don't have enough humans or if we do, we have to think, uh, we have to think about education in such a different way. I'm on a board, um, at Miami university at my alma mater. Um, and you know, even the conversations with them, it's, it's not just, Hey, go to school, get good grades, get your 40 year degree and come out. It's going to look different. And it's, and it's going to be a scenario where, um, you know, universities have a, have a tremendous opportunity to actually have a bigger impact because they, they can start to come out with things like, you know, um, accelerated uh, degree programs or certification programs and stuff. But then also, you know, there's an opportunity for um, organizations to start thinking differently about their own internal workforce and how do you transition from um, only hiring based on what somebody has done um, versus what they, you know, potentially can, can do and, ca and that are capable of it or capable of learning, right? Yeah, 100%. You know, you see companies like, um, you know, Airbnb who needs tons of developers around artificial intelligence and they were like, we can't find them because they don't exist. So we're going to create our own university and, you know, you know, mm -hmm. produce it. So I think we're going to see a lot more in that. So that kind of gets me excited on that front as well. Yeah. Is there conversation happening with, cause I think about this, I'm very non-traditional in how I had my education, mm -hmm. went for a year, then worked, traveled and weird in a retail company and helped build it and then came back and was at night classes at NKU and then mm -hmm. Thomas Moore. And, and so, but what I sat there and I was, I had been, I was 25 or 26, had been at tables of focus groups with CEOs and stuff. And now mm -hmm. I'm back getting the degree. And I went, Something about it, I was like, wait a minute, yeah. I've already gotten past this degree thing. Yeah. It's And so, but I still found myself in some accounting and some economics classes, but it was about, I learned from the conversation. Right? I didn't learn from the grade at the end of the class. Right. I didn't, I didn't learn from having that 3.8 GPA. I just didn't. Mm -hmm. I So I'm wondering with education, if people are going to put four years in mm -hmm. and then two more years you know in secondary and so and then what's it going to mean when you come out right like what how's it applied right because i do believe too that you know my significant she's so educated in so many degrees and pieces mm -hmm. of paper on the wall and it's almost like well if i want to do this thing i got to go back and get that piece of paper and it's like she's already ready right she really is and so 
um, an administration level in education. Mm-hmm. She's already ready to be a superintendent. It's mm-hmm. just she'd have to go back and get one more piece of paper. Yeah. Right? And yeah. it's like she's already we, – we went to dinner the other night with an assistant superintendent in one of the local school districts. Mm-hmm. And with her and me, and I'm sitting there like – she could already crush that job, but she's got to go back for 18 more months. So I don't, uh, I'm just, right? So yeah. I just don't know how this thing's lining up, and, and it seems like society's having this conversation. Oh, yeah. It's here, oh, yeah. right? And you're on boards. 100%. What do you think is going to come out of it? You're not allowed to, like, be anti, you're on a board, but what's going to happen <laughs> yeah, here? Yeah, I know. I'm not anti-education. No. I, I'm actually, I love education. Uh, yeah, I'm in a doctorate program right yep. now for strategic leadership, too. So I'm, I'm, I'm a dork when it comes to education mm-hmm. in general. So mm-hmm. um, there's that. I think it starts earlier than we're talking. Yeah. I think that's the issue. I think, um, and, it, and it sounds very strange to say this, at the end of the day, we we have to talk differently to our children about education as well. It's not just about the people that are in the workforce, and I think the workforce training programs are going to change, and that's going to evolve. That's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's there. But I think that what society is going to have to change is, number one, the traditional go to school, get good grades in four years, and you'll have a career, that's going to have to change because we're already seeing it with student loans, number one. Um, And you can't have, you know, diversity and inclusion when you've got scenarios where a degree costs, you know, more than you could ever earn and many, many times, right? Saddled with debt. It's insane. So that's one area. We also have to think differently around um, co-ops and internships with you know, those that are in high school and not just college. We have got to give exposure to our students so much earlier than we've ever been been thinking before. We have to prepare them for what a career actually looks like. Like, you know, I, and I'm sure you did too. You went through home ec and like what that looked like, (laughs) right? Like, okay, let's change, let's go backwards. Let's call it life skills. And then like, let's really think about what life skills look like and have that paired with experiential opportunities for students to actually see what life looks like in a career and not have them go to school and then only to be able to see what a career will look like three years in, you know, you have to have that experience so much earlier on. So I think that we're going to start to see some of that evolve. We're also going to see the education system from, um, you know, within high schools change a lot as well. I think that we're, we're going to have to see some, you know, increase in things around like, you know, technology or coding being a language just like Spanish. Like, why isn't, you know, JavaScript a language or React instead of, you know, always having to do your German? Right? Yeah, why is that just for the smartest kids? Right, right. right? It just seems, it seems silly, right? Like, yeah. that should just be, you know, our, our, you know, I have a seven-year-old. You know, he's already, you know, obviously he, he hears mommy talking about tech all the time. So there's that. But, you know, we see it all the time with our children. Like, they know how to flick, you know, you know, flick their laptops on now, you know, cause all of them are using laptops mm-hmm. with the remote learning, but you know, we see them sparking like this great energy around it. And why is it only for a few that just get to dive into the other side of the equation and learning how to build? It shouldn't be. If know? we want to have a great a country and, and we still want to be out here and have a great society, yeah. we've got to get there. I agree. 100%. W- what advice do you have for, um, entrepreneurs and people running companies like me because mm-hmm. ain't nothing special about me. I'm just out here trying to work hard. And there mm-hmm. are hundreds of thousands of us mm-hmm. that have 100 people working at the company, 150, 200. Yep. What do we need to do better? Give us this advice. Like, we already know oh we're good. You don't gosh. need to, like, pat us on the back anymore. I mean, put us in check. What do we need to do better? <sighs> Listening. I think that's, I I know it sounds silly, but anytime I'm in a room with brilliant, brilliant individuals, I notice, um, and it's really interesting to me that so many do not listen to either their younger generation or those that are like their front line. And I think that that is probably one of the hardest disconnects that I've seen with any entrepreneur or with any, um, any entrepreneur that has a team, um, that doesn't have a, you know, a a culture that's just rocking it out. Um, more often than not, I feel like they don't take the time to listen to those that aren't at their table. They, they really just listen to the squawk box next to them or the person patting them on the back or any of that. Like that's what they listen to. Um, cause it's, you know, it's ego, right? Like it's validation and all of that fun stuff. Right. Um, but I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is that, you know, we've got, 
and well, let's say prior to COVID, we had five ge- five generations working in the workforce at, at any given time. Now it's obviously we're we're seeing that reduced a bit, but I see all the time people like you know there for years everybody was putting down a millennial, and now it's everybody's putting down Gen Zs, and it's like is that what the next one's called? Sorry, Z. I just, yeah, these okay, Z, yeah, okay, yeah, I don't yeah, care, Gen I don't Zs, care, right? I don't, I, I can care about, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, care about right. all the topics. See, look, you I, just did it. No, but here's what no, I'm like this. <laughs> I'm saying up because I hate all the titles on oh, it. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. right, that's what I'm right, saying. Right, right, right. No, it's, it's like, not, oh, no, not no, you too. No, come on. Um, no, no I hate you. it. It's like, what? Like, oh, you were just born a month later, so sorry, you're different. Right, right, come on. right. No, I'm in the Oregon Trail uh, group. Oh, I was grouping. there. Yeah. Oh, I was totally there, yeah, right? It, yeah, it, it was. How much time do we waste? Yeah, so it's Oregon Trail. No, but I think that that's actually, like, Across the board, regardless as if it's the younger generation or if it's the, you know, the elders, if you will, it's just it's interesting how um, with a little bit of success, how the blinders go up. And I think that that is something that we all fundamentally have to really take that second look at and say, wait a minute, am I listening to the opinions of others? Am I, you know, am I a part of a problem or a solution here? Because I think that that's really what affects um, our teams and that's what affects culture for sure. And I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know if I listen well enough or not, Mike, but I know I need to do a better job probably. <laughs> He's going to stay. What do you think, man? Do I listen at a decent level? <laughs> you can call me out any way you want. It's decent. Okay, that means it needs to get better. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's at a decent level. Okay, so, yeah. here's, so here's what I think inside is that why wouldn't we want to listen? And if, if we want to run these companies and we think they're significant, we have all this growth mindset. It's like, man, growth mindset is a part of listening and growing and developing something better. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so maybe we just learned our best thing from, from the end as well. Maybe every, maybe it's going to help everybody else, but me too. <laughs> um, what do we miss? Do we miss anything? She's probably like, man, can I get up out of this table and out of this studio? No, no, it's been uh, it's been so much fun. I've I've definitely had a blast uh, just chatting. Thank you. So, uh, Michael, share all your social stuff at the end. Perfect. Um, is there a call to action of whether there's two people that listen or two hundred? Mm-hmm. Um, is there a call to action for anybody who would listen who's trying to grow and learn to this this conversation? Uh, yeah, reach out to me. Okay. Um, What's the I, best way? Because we'll share your social. What's the yeah, best way? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. Um, uh, I'm fairly consistent there. Um, but yeah, I, I am somebody that I don't care, you know, what age group, what demographic or anything. If, if I can be a resource in any way, I want to help support others. So, uh, questions, concerns, support, I'm always there. And she's PhD level, y'all. Watch, attempting. watch out. I know attempting. She's going to do it. <laughs> I have zero doubt. She will get finished before the next squirrel shows up. Exactly. I, prom- I, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank Hey, so all the adversity you've dealt with over the past year and a half, obviously we just met, so I can't even comprehend what that's been like, yeah. but I hope the next 15 months is better than the last. Thank you. Okay. So Kudos and let's roll on 2021.